Legion is dead, sir! Listen to me. You kill as many as you can. War for the Planet of the Apes, the third installment in the rebooted Planet of the Apes series, stands as a monumental achievement in both storytelling and technical prowess, pushing the boundaries of what is possible in cinema. Directed by Matt Reeves and released in 2017, the film not only concludes the story of Caesar, the ape leader portrayed with astonishing depth by Andy Serkis, but also elevates the entire franchise to new heights. With the new movie, Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes, which was shot in New South Wales, set to be released in three months' time, I thought we'd finish up with our coverage of the rebooted series. In their time, humans were capable of many great things, but now it is our time, and it is my kingdom, and I will conquer. Apes hunt humans. That is wrong. Together, you will die. No, together, strong. I'm also open to covering the original films, beginning with 1968's Planet of the Apes, featuring Charlton Heston. So if that's something you're interested in seeing over the next few months, please let me know in the comments below. Take your sticking paws off me, you damn dirty ape! What I love most about the rebooted series is that it masterfully subverts the narrative and thematic elements of the original films from the 1960s and 70s. This modern trilogy accomplishes a remarkable inversion, shifting the audience's empathy from the humans, who were the protagonists and victims in the original series, to the apes under Caesar's leadership. The shift is not only counterintuitive, considering the original films often portrayed apes as the antagonist or a terrifying other, but it also challenges the audience's preconceived notions about intelligence, civilization, and moral authority. The story picks up where its predecessor left off, with Caesar and his ape followers embroiled in a devastating conflict with human forces, led by a ruthless colonel, played with chilling intensity by Woody Harrelson. At the heart of War for the Planet of the Apes is its compelling narrative, which weaves together themes of revenge, empathy, and the quest for freedom. Unlike typical blockbuster fare, the film prioritizes character development and moral dilemmas of a sheer spectacle, resulting in a deeply emotional journey that challenges audiences to reflect on the nature of humanity and the bonds that unite us all. What sets this film apart is not just its narrative ambition, but also its groundbreaking use of technology. The production utilized cutting-edge motion capture to bring its ape characters to life, blurring the lines between digital and physical performance, which enables us to sympathize with their plight further. But War is not just a technical marvel, it's a film that challenges the conventions of its genre, offering a poignant commentary on the human condition. Its greatness lies in its ability to balance spectacle with heart, creating a cinematic experience that's both intellectually stimulating and deeply moving. Through its innovative production techniques, compelling storytelling, and profound thematic depth, the film marked a significant milestone in filmmaking, demonstrating the power of cinema to explore the most fundamental aspects of our existence. Hey guys, what's happening? Niat here with Film Comics Explained, and as requested, today we're exploring probably my favorite movie in the rebooted series. Fifteen years have passed since the outbreak of the ALZ-113 virus, also known as the simian flu, which decimated human populations worldwide and led to the emergence of highly intelligent apes as depicted in Rise. Under the leadership of Caesar, a highly intelligent chimpanzee, the apes sought a peaceful coexistence with the remaining humans. However, this fragile peace was shattered by Koba, another chimp who, feeling betrayed by humans, incited conflict in Dawn. Despite moments of hope for harmony between humans and apes, symbolized by the bond between Caesar and a human named Malcolm, the revelation that Dreyfus had contacted a northern military base hinted at impending doom. Caesar's group now finds refuge in a command base within the woods, evading a determined special forces colonel leading the Alpha Omega military faction, intent on eradicating the ape population. This war has escalated to a critical juncture, marking a decisive battle for survival between humans and apes. Two years after the skirmishes in San Francisco, the Alpha Omega forces, with the assistance of donkeys, apes that were formerly loyal to Koba, who, fearing reprisal from their own kind, 
betray the apes by aiding the humans, relentlessly hunt for Caesar's colony. The movie commences with a covert operation, as Red, alongside other so-called donkeys, aids the army in their search for enemy strongholds. During their mission, they spot several apes on horseback and are about to launch an attack when they discover a trench, hinting at the proximity of a base. Prompted by the colonel's orders to commence firing, the army initiates their assault, employing both stealth and overwhelming force. Initially, the army's advanced weaponry gives them an edge, but the tide quickly turns when one of the chimpanzees manages to escape to a nearby base and summons reinforcements. The apes then counterattack vigorously, using smoke bombs, spears, and firearms taken from the soldiers, capitalizing on their high ground to overpower the human forces. The aftermath sees Red and four soldiers captured amidst a scene of devastation and numerous ape casualties, with Maurice revealing to a distraught Caesar that 63 lost their lives in the skirmish. You're him. You're Caesar. We've been searching for you for so long. Caesar is the heart and soul of the film. Evolving from the intelligent, compassionate leader in the earlier films, in this installment, he grapples with darker emotions of revenge, grief, and the heavy burden of leadership, while Maurice, the wise and gentle orangutan, continues to serve as Caesar's moral compass and confidant. A sniper known as Preacher is the first to speak among the captives, disclosing their long-term mission to find Caesar, whose existence some had started to doubt. But his terrified comrades urge him to halt talking, fearing imminent execution by what they perceive as mere animals. Here, Caesar clarifies that he did not instigate the war, pinning the blame on Koba, an ape he'd previously killed for inciting the conflict. He then insists that his actions are purely defensive, aimed at safeguarding his species. I fight only to protect apes. Yeah? What about him? Red boldly interrupts, proclaiming his lack of fear and asserting the colonel's absolute power and determination to annihilate the apes before being escorted away by a gorilla named Winter. First Caesar die, then all of you die. Contrary to the expectations of the captured soldiers, they're set free with a message for their leader, vacate the woods and the bloodshed will cease signaling Caesar's preference for peace over perpetual conflict. They are the message, Maurice. He will see we are not savages. Unfortunately, at the same time, Winter emerges, his head bloodied, claiming he was attacked by the traitor who then escaped. In response, Caesar and his group retreat to a more secure location hidden beneath the waterfall, where they pay tribute to their fallen comrades. During this period of mourning, Caesar's son, Blue Eyes, arrives back with their friend Rocket, bearing news from their expedition. They've essentially discovered an oasis, a sanctuary far from human territories, potentially offering a new beginning for the ape colony. And that evening, Rocket and Blue Eyes share details of their journey, describing the long trek, which involves crossing a vast desert, a natural barrier likely to deter human pursuit. Despite Winter's urgency to depart immediately for this promised land, the consensus is that a hasty migration without thorough planning could endanger the entire group. The journey was manageable for the pair due to their ability to remain undetected, but the risk of encountering humans increases significantly with the whole group in motion. Tragically, that very night, the tranquility is shattered as Alpha Omega soldiers, under the command of Colonel McCullough, stealthily approach the ape's command base. The Colonel is the human antagonist of the film, but to label him merely as a villain would oversimplify Harrelson's complex performance. McCullough is effectively driven by a ruthless determination to preserve humanity at any cost, embodying the fear and desperation of a species on the brink of extinction. Caesar, vigilant and quick to react, spots lights and ropes signifying the soldier's incursion, before entrusting the safety of his wife and younger son to Blue Eyes, before setting off to confront the threat. As the soldiers advance, Luca, on guard duty, is alerted by Caesar to rally the others. Despite Blue Eyes and Rocket managing to neutralize some of the intruders, the grim revelation comes when they overhear Colonel McCullough erroneously proclaiming King Kong was dead on the radio. In a moment of confusion and horror, as he surveys the chimps he's mistakenly killed, the Colonel realizes his fatal error. He's not killed Caesar, but his family. Driven by rage, Caesar attempts to pursue the Colonel, climbing a rope to exact his vengeance. However, his efforts are thwarted when the Colonel severs the rope, denying him retribution. Distraught by the events, Caesar returns to the base, directing the apes to locate Cornelius. To his relief, he finds his boy unharmed and entrusts him to Lake's care, 
the lover of blue eyes, before embarking on a solo mission to confront McCullough. Meanwhile, he instructs the rest of the apes to proceed towards the desert, believing that his personal vendetta against the colonel will divert attention from them and ensure their safe passage. Despite his insistence on going alone, citing the distraction his quest for McCullough would provide, he's unexpectedly joined by Maurice the orangutan, Rocket the chimp, and Luca the gorilla. Caesar initially refuses their company, determined to face the colonel alone, but his companions are adamant about staying by his side. Each expresses a unique reason for their insistence. Luca believes he can aid in locating McCullough's ever-moving base. Rocket is prepared to offer his support in any confrontation, and Maurice insists on accompanying Caesar to ensure he remains true to his moral compass and makes it back alive. I may not make it back. <laughs> As they advance, the apes come across a small encampment, marked by the presence of smoke. Their discovery leads to a confrontation with a solitary man who moves to aim his weapon at them, only to be swiftly neutralized by Caesar. Within the confines of the dwelling, they find a young girl, whom they later name Nova, bedridden and visibly scared. Maurice extends a gesture of kindness by offering her a doll, and significantly, Nova's attempt to speak but her inability to do so marks a crucial narrative development, foreshadowing its relevance to the climax. Despite Caesar's initial reluctance to bring Nova along, citing the dangers of their journey, Maurice insists on not abandoning her, highlighting his compassionate nature. Thus, Nova joins their group as they proceed. We cannot take her, Maurice. Their journey leads them to a military outpost where they encounter Winter, a defector who sided with the humans under the promise of safety from Red. This betrayal essentially enabled McCullough to infiltrate the ape's base and kill Caesar's family. During the interrogation, Winter explains the Colonel's forces are moving towards a border, anticipating reinforcements from the north. But the situation escalates when Winter, spotting humans nearby, attempts to alert them. In a desperate bid to maintain control, the group restrain him, with Caesar ultimately silencing Winter permanently to prevent their discovery. Throughout these events, Caesar is tormented by visions of Koba, the deceased ape who betrayed their kind. These nightmares, featuring a bloodied and scarred Koba, echo his last words to Caesar, underscoring the internal conflict and the burden of leadership that he carries, haunted by past betrayals and the relentless pursuit of vengeance. Ape not kill ape. <laughs> Previously more inclined towards peaceful coexistence with humans, influenced by the kindness of his adoptive human family, and the mutual respect shared with Malcolm from the earlier film, the relentless cycle of violence and loss has hardened Caesar's compassion. Of course, he's also burdened with guilt over killing Nova's presumed human father, which initially makes it difficult for him to face her. Opting to shadow the soldiers navigating through the snowy mountains, their journey is abruptly interrupted by the sound of gunfire, Seeking cover and puzzled by the commotion, they approach cautiously, only to discover three soldiers, shot and left in the snow. Among them, one clings to life, but like Nova, is unable to speak. Upon realizing the soldier's fate is sealed by his injuries, Caesar mercifully ends his suffering. In the midst of their investigation, a small figure, cloaked in a jacket, cunningly makes off with a rifle and one of the horses. The apes pursue it until they trap it within the confines of a derelict building, revealing the thief to be a tiny, elderly chimpanzee. Bad ape! Returning the stolen items, the chimp extends a gesture of kindness by offering his jacket to Nova. Astonishingly, he possesses the ability to speak like Caesar. He recounts his past life in a zoo and how he acquired the name Bad Ape from the frequent scoldings of humans, providing a glimpse into his unique backstory and survival through the chaos unleashed by the simian flu. What I love about Bad Ape is that he adds a layer of humor and pathos to the film, with his character providing levity in an otherwise dark narrative, while also highlighting the widespread effects of the simian flu beyond Caesar's group. I'm okay. He warmly refers to the group as friends and shares his food with them, which bears the label California Border. Curious about the origin of the food, Caesar inquires, prompting Bad Ape to reveal it was scavenged from what was once a human zoo, now repurposed as a quarantine camp. He recounts the harrowing things he witnessed there, not only the cruel treatment of fellow apes, but also the execution of infected humans attempting to gain entry. His story paints a grim picture of the camp as a place of death and disease, foreshadowing the dire events to come. 
Initially hesitant, he refuses to lead them to the camp. However, after learning about the tragedy that befell Caesar's family and sharing his own loss, a grief that Rocket also understands, Bad Ape consents to guide them. You think you find him at Human Zoo? Maybe. Then maybe I take you. In a poignant display of empathy and the potential for peaceful coexistence between the apes and humans, a stark contrast to the divisiveness sown by Cobra and the Colonel, Luca demonstrates kindness by placing flowers behind Nova's ears, eliciting a smile from her. I believe that to the apes, Nova represents innocence and the potential for harmony between humans and their kind. Her bond with Maurice and the others is touching, transcending the spoken word and underscoring the film's exploration of communication and connection beyond language. Her character challenges the notion of the other, symbolizing hope for a future where peace is possible. As their journey to the border camp continues, Nova begins to learn sign language from Maurice, showcasing her growing bond with the apes. Upon arriving at the camp, Caesar and Lucas scout for a strategic position, but are ambushed by two scouts. In the ensuing confrontation, Rocket and Luca manage to eliminate the threat, but Luca suffers a fatal injury in the process of defending Caesar. In a tender moment mirroring Luca's earlier act of kindness, Nova places the flowers in his ears as she mourns his impending death. Luca, comforted by his ability to protect Caesar, expresses a sense of fulfillment in his final moments, highlighting the sacrifices made in the name of loyalty and protection. Anguished by the consequences of his decisions, which resulted in his friend's death, Caesar shares with the group his initial preference to undertake the mission alone. It's here that Maurice, reflecting on Caesar's intense animosity towards the Colonel, suggests that such hatred is drawing parallels between Caesar and Kobo. They must pay. Disturbed by Luca's demise and Maurice's poignant observation, Caesar, driven by a mix of grief and determination, ventures alone to the camp under the cover of night. There he discovers apes from his clan, strung up on the mountain, revealing the grim fate that has befallen his entire group, now ensnared in bondage. In a sudden turn of events, Red ambushes Caesar, rendering him unconscious with a rifle strike, and upon awakening, he is confronted by McCullough, who expresses surprise at capturing the ape leader and criticizes him for abandoning his people. Caesar retorts, explaining his personal vendetta against the colonel for the murder of his family, to which McCullough offers a hollow apology, admitting his intention was to eliminate Caesar. You were angry at me for something I did that was an act of war, but you're taking this much too personally. As Caesar grapples with the harsh reality of their predicament, he's forced into labor alongside his captured brethren, tasked with the daunting job of reconstructing part of the camp's wall. Amidst the toil, his gaze meets that of Lake and Cornelius, who are confined in separate enclosures designated for adults and children respectively. Under harsh conditions of starvation and dehydration, the apes, while shackled, are compelled to labor. An incident where an older ape inadvertently causes a structure to collapse leads him to being taken aside and whipped mercilessly by Red. Caesar's intervention, imploring Red to stop, sparks a collective act of defiance among the apes, who refuse to continue their work, resulting in Caesar being whipped in the older ape's stead. The colonel then confronts him, demanding he order the apes back to work as Caesar appeals for the basic necessities of food and water for them. But McCullough's response is ruthless. He executes the older ape and is on the brink of killing Caesar when Lake and the others resume their labor to protect him. Unfortunately, as a form of retribution, Caesar is hung in full view of the apes with Maurice, Bad Ape, Rocket, and the girl witnessing the scene from afar. Later that night, under the escort of Red and Breacher, Caesar is brought to McCullough's office in chains. During their discussion, he astonishes the colonel with his acumen, suggesting that the northern soldiers were not coming to ally with McCullough, but to oppose him, before remarking on McCullough's lack of mercy. Do you have any idea what your mercy would do to us? No matter what you say, you'd eventually replace us. That's the law of nature. The colonel retorts, accusing Caesar of initially coming with the intent to kill him. However, Caesar countered, stating that he had indeed shown mercy by sparing McCullough's soldiers and proposing peace, only for McCullough to respond by murdering his family. Here the colonel reveals a deeply personal tragedy, describing how his own son, 
once a soldier under his command, succumbed to the mutated strain of the simian flu, resulting in the loss of speech and cognitive functions, a fate shared by other soldiers and medics in his unit. The ALZ113 virus initially served as a genetically engineered retrovirus designed to cure Alzheimer's disease. However, while it significantly enhanced the cognitive functions and intelligence of apes, it had a lethal effect on humans. This dichotomy led to a catastrophic decline in the human population as it spread rapidly across the globe, causing widespread mortality due to its highly contagious nature and the absence of immunity or cure among humans. In scientific terms, the ALZ113 virus functioned by crossing the blood-brain barrier and targeting neural cells. In apes, it facilitated neural regeneration and increased synaptic plasticity, leading to enhanced intelligence and cognitive abilities. For humans, however, the virus triggered a severe immune response, leading to systemic inflammation, organ failure, and ultimately death in a vast majority of the infected population. But here in war, the virus has undergone a mutation, resulting in an evolved strain that further impacts the surviving human population. This mutated strain, while no longer universally lethal, significantly impairs cognitive functions and renders those infected mute. From a scientific perspective, the mutation likely affects areas of the brain responsible for speech and higher cognitive functions, such as the Broca's area for speech production and the frontal cortex, which is crucial for problem solving, memory, and judgment. The mutation altered the virus's mechanism of action, enabling it to specifically target and disrupt neural pathways and networks involved in speech and cognitive processing. This disruption likely resulted from the degeneration of neural tissue, interference with neurotransmitter release, or impairment of synaptic function, leading to the observed symptoms of muteness and reduced cognitive capabilities. The virus's ability to induce such specific neurological deficits suggests a highly targeted effect on the brain's structure and function, underscoring the dramatic and tragic consequences of its evolution on the remnants of humanity. Faced with their regression to a more primitive state, the colonel made the harrowing decision to execute his son and the affected soldiers, believing this was the only way to combat the virus's evolution. Despite the potential for a medical resolution, as considered by superiors, McCullough's drastic actions, including the killing of his own troops, sparked outrage among them. This act of mercilessness led to his alienation and marked his faction as radicalized, prompting the rest of the army to mobilize against him, intending to dismantle his extremist group and put a stop to his reign of terror. This is a holy war. If we lose, it will be a planet of apes. The imprisoned apes are finally provided with sustenance, all except for Caesar, who singled out for deprivation. And in his weakened state, he experiences another haunting vision of Kova, who sinisterly invites him to embrace death alongside him. At the same time, from a distance, Maurice, Rocket, Bad Ape, and Nova devise a plan to infiltrate the camp. While Maurice and Rocket investigate a potential entry through the tunnels beneath them, Nova bravely enters the camp, managing to deliver water directly to Caesar in his cage. The girl is then given food by the other apes, which she promptly delivers to Caesar, along with the doll previously given to her by Maurice. Unfortunately, as soldiers draw near, Rocket is forced to heroically divert their attention, sacrificing his freedom to ensure that she escaped. The next morning, McCullough, upon visiting Caesar's enclosure and assigning him solitary labor in the quarry, carelessly picks up Nova's doll, now marked with blood. Simultaneously, Maurice, Bad Ape, and Nova discover an underground route into the camp, but their progress is momentarily halted when they encounter water, risking flooding and causing them to quickly act by blocking the section, preventing further disaster. Communicating through sign language, Caesar, Rocket, and the others plan to connect with both the adult apes and the children. Rocket then cunningly distracts a guard with a mischievous act, allowing Bad Ape to pull him into their underground escape route. Now armed with a key and the guard's weapon, Caesar and Rocket manage to free the children, and together with the group, they navigate through the tunnel, escaping the confines of the camp. But before their departure, Caesar confides in Rocket, acknowledging his similarity to Kova due to his inability to let go of his hatred for the Colonel. Kova, he could not escape his hate, and I still cannot escape mine. Deeply affected with this realization, Caesar decides to confront McCullough directly in his office, as an opposing military faction initiates an assault on the camp, with rockets and gunfire creating a tumultuous backdrop. 
Yet upon reaching his office, he discovers him in a state of drunkenness and mute, a consequence of exposure to the new strain of the simian flu from the doll taken from Caesar's cage. Faced with this situation, Caesar picks up a firearm, and the colonel, in a moment of desperation, guides it to his own head, seemingly inviting his own execution. But Caesar finds himself unable to commit the act, and as he exits, McCullough takes matters into his own hands, ending his life with the weapon. Amid the ensuing chaos, and as the other apes make their escape, Caesar attempts to reunite with them. He grabs a grenade belt, intending to destroy a fuel tank to cover their retreat, but is hindered when Preacher shoots him with an arrow. Witnessing his plight, Red faces a pivotal moment. Despite being positioned amongst the human soldiers, he opts to save Caesar by using a grenade launcher against Preacher, effectively betraying the humans and sacrificing himself in an act of redemption. In this critical juncture, Caesar takes the opportunity to detonate the grenade, successfully obliterating the fuel tanks and causing the entire facility to explode. As Caesar makes his escape, the rival military faction celebrates the destruction of Alpha Omega. When they begin to aim their weapons at him, an avalanche, triggered by the explosion, thunders down the mountain. This catastrophic event forces all the apes to seek refuge in the trees, while the avalanche eradicates all the soldiers, removing any threat to their future safety. Now free from captivity, and with no adversaries left to challenge them, Caesar is able to lead the apes towards the promised oasis. Upon arrival, as the apes revel in their newfound freedom, Maurice discerns the gravity of Caesar's injury. Facing his impending demise, Caesar entrusts Maurice with the care of Cornelius, ensuring that his legacy will endure. Maurice solemnly promises that Cornelius will be aware of his father's sacrifice and the legacy he leaves behind. And content with this assurance, Caesar passes away surrounded by his community, who mourn the loss of their leader. Apes are strong with or without me. Directed by Matt Reeves and co-written with Mark Bomback, War for the Planet of the Apes is a testament to the power of a well-crafted script. The screenplay is a marvel of storytelling, blending action, emotional depth, and thematic complexity to create a narrative that is both gripping and thought-provoking. War for the Planet of the Apes, at its heart, is about the intimate relationship between these characters. What's so exciting is that we are capturing the actor's performance, tracking that into these photoreal apes. The script excels in its depth, weaving a tale that is as much about internal struggle as it is about external conflict. It explores the culmination of Caesar's journey, betraying him not just as a leader of the apes, but as a character grappling with vengeance, forgiveness, and the burden of his past decisions. This personal journey is set against the backdrop of a larger conflict, creating a story that balances intimate character studies with a scale of epic storytelling. For me, one of the script's strongest attributes is its development of complex, multi-dimensional characters. Caesar is a character torn between his better instincts and his desire for revenge. The Colonel, on the other hand, is presented not merely as a villain, but as a tragic figure driven to extremes by his fear of extinction. Even secondary characters such as Maurice, Rocket, Bad Ape, and Nova are given arcs and motivations to enrich the narrative, making the world of the film filled lived in and real. I really appreciated how the screenplay navigated themes of moral ambiguity with skill, refusing to paint its conflict in black and white. Both apes and humans are shown to be capable of cruelty and compassion, raising questions about the nature of humanity and the possibility of coexistence. This ambiguity elevates the script beyond a simple good versus evil narrative, challenging audiences to consider the complexities of revenge, justice and empathy. It's an epic film, and it exists on so many different levels as a, as a metaphor, but also it exists as a piece of entertainment. It's very, very moving. It's emotionally engaging. It has great humor in it, too, and pathos. And, you know, it has it's an action movie, but at the same time, it, it's not overly spectacular so that it feels gratuitous. It's beautifully directed and focused so that you're taken on a journey that you really don't, you, you really can't second guess what's going to happen next. War for the Planet of the Apes is, at its heart, a deeply moving story, and the script ensures that its emotional beats resonate. The loss of Caesar's family, his internal conflict, and the sacrifices made by characters throughout the film are handled with a sensitivity that allows for genuine engagement. And the script's ability to elicit empathy for its characters, both human and ape, is a key element of its success. By focusing on the oppression of the apes and their fight for dignity, the new series flips the script on the original's premise. 
The apes, once the oppressors in the distant future of the original films, are now the oppressed, striving to carve out a place for themselves in a world dominated by humans. This narrative inversion challenges us to reconsider our allegiances and sympathies, further blurring the lines between the us and them dichotomy. I was so drawn into this idea of watching these apes sort of behaving in ways that really were about us. And I think that there's a kind of universality to it because the ape behavior and the human nature is very universal. They're on the edge of extinction. They're fighting for survival. And so the question starts to be, just how extreme would you be in order to preserve your very species, to, to allow for a world where there can be decency and humanity and gentleness again? How extreme will you be to fight for that? The use of cutting-edge motion capture technology allows for an unprecedented level of emotional expressiveness in the ape characters, bridging the gap between human and ape. This technological advancement enables us to connect with the apes on an emotional level, making their pain, joy, and struggles palpable. And I think the visual realism of the apes, combined with their human-like expressions and emotions, plays a crucial role in shifting our empathy towards them. You're not just standing in for the role until the magic's done later on. You're not just representing the character. You are the character for real. When you're in the audience, what you're really looking for is, is that emotional connection. That can't be done by just somebody in a gray suit that's just doing the body movements. That has to come from trained talent. The trilogy's narrative structure and visual storytelling further aid in the subversion by placing the apes in situations that highlight their intelligence, familial bonds, and capacity for love and sacrifice, we're invited to side with them against the backdrop of human antagonism and fear. The humans, while not universally villainized, are often portrayed as fearful, aggressive, and unable to move beyond prejudice, echoing the behavior of the apes in the original series. In this way, the new trilogy succeeded in what seemed almost impossible. It recontextualizes the conflict between humans and apes, making the audience root for the very creatures that once embodied fear and otherness. Through its nuanced portrayal of characters, exploration of complex themes, and innovative use of technology, the series not only subverts the original films, but also offers a profound commentary on empathy, coexistence, and the nature of humanity itself. Well, the entire franchise, the entire story system is built around a metaphor of apes reflecting humanity. It's, it's so much easier in a way to be able to, to see ourselves by abstracting ourselves and being able to, you know, to see a society which is very similar to our own. So that's why they've endured, that's why these films have endured, that's why they continue to be really powerful, why they can still be social commentary, why they still can be, you know, the, this brilliant combination of being entertainment but at the same time be moving powerfully uh, engaging and comment on, on the planet. The final chapter stands out as the pinnacle of the rebooted series, offering a fitting tribute to a character that's deeply resonated with us over time. The journey of Caesar is the emotional core of the story, showcasing a leader torn between his instincts for vengeance and his inherent sense of justice and mercy. Andy Serkis's performance, captured through groundbreaking motion capture technology, brings an unparalleled level of nuance, physicality, and emotion to the character, making Caesar not just a memorable CGI creation, but a deeply relatable and tragic figure. His portrayal captures the weight of leadership and the pain of loss, and Serkis's ability to convey complex emotions through the digital avatar of an ape is nothing short of remarkable, cementing Caesar as one of the most memorable characters of all time, I think Andy is one of the most gifted actors I've ever run into. It, it blows my mind to see how much he can convey with saying nothing. I've never encountered that kind of extremity of just ability to convey things through his eyes. When something is performance capture, it means it's driven by performance, and performance is often driven by surprise, discovery, because when things are happening and the camera is rolling, you've caught it, and that moment illuminates something. And that only comes when you're willing to, to throw away, to some degree, what you've got. Of course, you have your roadmap, you have your script, but try to find something deeper, some more surprises. And Andy's that kind of actor. He was constantly surprising me. He is one of the greatest actors ever, I think. Just being able to see him do his thing on set every day is, it's amazing. <laughs> Andy is a special, special performer. Just his energy and, and what he brings to, to, to Caesar, like it's, you know, when they turn ape, 
they're apes, you know what I mean? And uh, it's great to see that. And just on top of him just being an amazing performer, he's a, he's a great human being. He's, he's the nicest guy. As an actor, as a human being, this is, this is the most incredible gentleman. I've, I think I've had one of the most incredible gentlemen I've ever met in my life in terms of grounding the leader within the, our filmmaking journey. Colonel McCullough's actions, though often cruel, are rooted in a twisted sense of survivalism, making him a compelling and at times sympathetic character. And the dynamic between Caesar and the Colonel provides the film with a moral and ideological battleground, exploring themes of extremism, mercy, and the cycle of violence. Woody Harrelson brings a chilling intensity to the antagonist driven by ruthless determination to save humanity from extinction. His performance is powerful, portraying McCullough not as a one-dimensional villain, but as a complex character whose extreme actions are rooted in fear and desperation. He nails the Colonel's charisma and menace, making him a formidable foe for Caesar and a fascinating character in his own right. I mean, Woody's a very inventive actor, and he ended up having a lot to contribute to the character at the script stage. You know, we, we had written it, you know, Mark and I, very detailed, and then he had certain aspects where he thought, oh, I love that. Can we try to eliminate that further? And we got into a really great dialogue with him about that so that we could really explore his humanity, and it was, um, it was really fun. Well, yeah, I mean, you could easily look at the Colonel as a bad guy, but I kind of look at him as a guy who, who feels called upon to do something great and important in this uncertain world. And Woody and I had the most amazing journey on this, and we, we became very close friends as a result. Because of the Caesar-Colonel relationship, you know, he was very willing to, to take it as far as he could, and, and we completely connected. The kindness, intelligence and empathy of Maurice towards others, including the human child Nova, highlight the potential for understanding and compassion between species. And Karen Conival's performance as Maurice, the wise and empathetic orangutan, is a standout. Through motion capture, Conival brings a gentle strength and deep compassion to the role, serving as Caesar's moral compass. Her interactions with Nova are particularly touching, highlighting the potential for empathy and understanding across the species. With Carnival's portrayal adding a layer of emotional depth to the film, emphasizing the themes of friendship and solidarity. He's Caesar's conscience, he's Caesar's, he's been his advisor for a, a very long time, and his commitment and his devotion to Caesar uh, is, is complete. As Nova, the mute girl who forms a bond with the apes, Amaya Miller delivers a poignant and captivating performance without the use of spoken dialogue. Miller's expressive face and body language convey a wide range of emotions, from fear, curiosity to affection. Despite the tragic death of her father, her bond with the ape characters, especially Maurice, is heartwarming, underscoring the film's message of compassion and coexistence. It's just, it's crazy because I pictured something in my head reading the script and it turned out like a thousand times better when I first saw it. This is kind of how we met, is with her riding behind me. So we actually met Karen and Amaya on Navarone, which is very beautiful, yeah. And I could feel immediately that this was an honest connection, that Amaya is a stunning, stunning young actor. And uh, our connection was right there before we'd even gotten to set. Nova represents humanity and goodness, and she just kind of is the light in the movie, and she's just the breath of fresh air, and she, including Ben Abe. Thanks. <laughs> but yeah. you're welcome, Steve. <laughs> but she also just brings out the good in Caesar because everything is just so dark, and she just makes him see everything in like a different light. And I'm I'm glad she does because things are going downhill. Bad Ape's backstory and quirky personality enrich the film's tapestry of characters offering a glimpse into the experiences of apes outside of Caesar's immediate circle. And Steve Zahn does a terrific job of providing comic relief, while also highlighting the broader impact of the simian flu from another point of view. I love, I love the name because, it, you know, I don't know what it implies. I mean, uh, the obvious, which is, oh, you're the bad ape. Now you're, you're the bad guy in the story, which would, couldn't be more <laughs> not the opposite of that, really. But he's bad ape because he's mischievous, you know, at the zoo. Bad ape, bad ape. He's, he's excitable. He's, he's got energy. Um, whereas, you know, the other apes are, are more grounded and more, you know, heavy and slow in their speech, and he's a completely different speed. Both Rocket and Luca contribute significantly to the emotional weight of the film, demonstrating the depths of bonds formed in the face of hardship. Through motion capture, Terry Notary and Michael Adamthwaite deliver performances that are both physically impressive and emotionally resonant. 
their characters' bravery, loyalty, and sacrifices, adding to the film's exploration of friendship and devotion during periods of adversity. Terry is, you know, he's a, he's, an, he's world class and and a unique human being. And really, this, this this franchise, these three films particularly, would not be anything without his involvement. Because he's not only playing a character in it, but he's also keeping an eye on every single other ape performer in this and coaching them. Finally, Red's character arc, culminating in a moment of sacrifice, cannot be overlooked. It illustrates the complex motivations driving individuals and the possibility of absolution. Tylson's portrayal of Red's internal conflict and eventual redemption adds complexity, exploring the motivations and pressures that lead individuals to make difficult choices in times of war. What I can take this motion capture data and make that translate into a character that you actually can relate to. The way that you can read genuine emotion has reached another level. Oh no! All of the performances are pivotal in bringing these characters to life, supported by a script that values emotional depth and moral complexity. And the film stands as a testament to the power of character in driving narrative and theme. This movie is, is all about you know, otherness, it's about fundamentalism, it's about what you do to save your own tribe above anybody else's. You know, these are all questions that we're facing. It couldn't be more of a perfect metaphor for our times. I think I really do believe this movie is a film for our ages. To be able to literally flip, you know, flip the world on its head and see a human nature within another kind really does allow us to put our condition under, under a microscope in a very interesting way. War is a remarkable achievement in cinema showcasing an exceptional blend of technical sophistication and visionary direction. The film not only advanced the narrative and thematic elements established in the previous installments, but also set a benchmark for visual effects, sound design, cinematography and overall filmmaking. It was this amazing story of an outsider who was you know, brought up with human beings and you know, grew up with love and then at a certain age was rejected and then thrown into another situation, a kind of a facility. And, 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 and the, the pages were going by and I was thinking this, this incredible story of a, of, of a, of a, a boy becoming a, a revolutionary and then leading his kind to freedom. And, and it was like, and by the way, it's an ape. Matt Reeves' direction is nothing short of masterful, demonstrating a clear vision for the story and its execution. His handling of the film's complex themes such as leadership, morality, and the quest for peace is both thoughtful and compelling. The story is very much an ape point of view story. You come into it through Caesar's perspective, you see this war that's been going on and the, the losses that the apes are taking and Caesar taking it very, very personally. And on the one front, it's a giant war movie. It's filled with action and battles. But in the foreground, it's really about Caesar's war within his heart and the struggle for his soul. Will he lose any sense of, for lack of a better phrase, humanity? He manages to balance action-packed sequences with intimate character moments, ensuring that the film's heart and intellect are never overshadowed by its spectacle. His ability to elicit strong performances from the cast, both human and digital, speaks to his skill as a director. His attention to detail and his commitment to the film's thematic integrity make War for the Planet of the Apes a standout piece of cinematic storytelling, leading to my assessment that it's the best film in the rebooted series and one of the best third entries in trilogies. You know, my hat's off to him because I, I love his, his pursuit of excellence. I think that he's got a great vision and he's going to bring it to the screen and it's going to be awesome. Matt is incredible. He never stops thinking about his vision and he is really good at letting you know what's going on in his head. That's the whole point of directing. He is such a fine director and he's so um, truth-seeking missile for the moment of story that all I have to do is be present in the scenes, listen, and I trust him implicitly, like whatever Matt asked me to do. If he says, uh, can Maurice this a go? Yeah, yeah. The result is a film that is not only visually stunning, but also deeply human. In war, technology and artistry converge to create a truly remarkable cinematic experience. With that said, that's all for today, folks. A huge thanks to everyone that requested we finally finish the series. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video, and if there's anything else you'd like for me to cover, please don't hesitate to ask. As always, it's been a pleasure. Niat here with Film Comics Explained. Thanks for stopping by. Cobra still haunts us.
Why didn't I see that he could not forgive what humans did to him? Have you finally come to save your apes? I came for you. You cannot save them. Join me. No. Seven will know what Caesar did for 